Hello, everyone. Welcome to Feedstuffs 365. I'm Sarah Muirhead, and joining us today to review the 2021 recommended requirements for dairy cattle is a familiar face, Dr. Al Kurtz of Ant Hill. Welcome, Al. Thanks for coming back with us. Thank you. It's good to be back, Sarah. It was a, a year ago in December when this new publication came out, and it's got a little different handle. We all were familiar with the NRC, which stood for National Research Council, 2001, which was the previous dairy nutritional requirements. But the new one is called NASEM for National Academy Academies of Science, Engineering, Medicine. So that's a little different handle, and that's kind of the origin of it. There was a change in 2015. But... There was a preview of this too. Some of you may have been familiar with, there was a uh, ADSA Discover Conference at the end of August and early September a year ago in which the, the authors previewed what was coming out in this publication. So now it's been out for a year, I thought it might be a good time to, to take a look at it. Um, we'll, we'll do it in two sections. There's a calf section and there's a one related to heifers. The first section, Jim Drake of the University of Illinois was responsible for that. And if you know him, he's very thorough and very diligent about putting things together. So in the 2001 edition, for the first time, there was a young calf model put together in which you could put in like the amount of milk replacer, the, the nutrient content of it, the calf starter, the body weight of the calf, you know, the environmental temperature, and you could look at an example of a feeding program and see how it's working relative to how the calves are doing. So that was a big plus in development in the, in the previous one. But there's been some refinement of that since then because that was primarily based on uh, male veal calves and so they have a different body composition. And also there was a, a detailed review of many published studies of which the will show a graph from one of those studies that I was involved with uh, a graduate student of Jim Drakeley's at Illinois. It's a study that I refer to many times because it looks at a more traditional 2020 milk replacer feeding program. That's what you see across the first figure at the top, the little color coding. Uh, 2020 milk replacer versus a 28 protein 15% fat milk replacer fed at a higher level and the, the uh, calf starters uh, that was consumption. So you see the week by week example of what those calves did. We weaned them at the end of six weeks, which was two weeks earlier than typical. But then we followed them in all the way out to 10 weeks, which it generally should happen that any study with calves before weaning after they wean, it should continue for another two weeks to look if, is, if there's any carryover effects. But just briefly, if you look at the um, yellow column, that's the one pound feeding rate of the 2020 milk replacer. And you look at the red column, that was fed as a percent of body weight. So as their body weight increased, the amount that was fed increased. And you see that it was about twice as much of the milk replacer fed. And then you see the other two little bars, they're the amount of calf starter consumed by the calves on these two treatments. Now notice at first week, there's very little starter intake. And sometimes I hear people say, well, then we shouldn't feed much or we shouldn't feed it at all if they don't eat much. But the key here is the intake approximately doubles each week. And so if you wait, to begin feeding it, you're just going to push back the starter intake and maybe the age at which you can wean them. So these are weaned at uh, six weeks, in of six weeks, and you see their intakes then increase after that. And basically, we met the objective of you take the birth weight and you try to double it by the end of, of two months of age. So now if we move on to the next... Uh, figure, actually it's a table. After that 2001 
NRC young calf model. There were quite a few studies done, particularly at University of Illinois, Cornell University, Michigan State universities, that looked at this model and evaluated it. And they found out that there were some differences than what the model showed, because as I uh, commented previously, the, the previous model was based on uh, larger male fattening veal calves. So you have a difference, difference in efficiency of converting energy and protein to gain. So the key was then to have enough body composition data and growth data that you could put in young heifer calves, which are are the animal which is the animal you want to use this with and so in that table you can see that the it was put together with this these kind of data uh, the average daily gains range from 37.37 pounds to 2.2 that's one kilogram the dry matter intake of course went up the metabolism of energy goes up the the amount of crude protein increased now notice the last column the percent of crude protein and dry matter intake. It starts out fairly low and then goes up to 25.6. That's not the percent of protein in the starter though. That's the percent of protein in the mix, the blend of the amount of milk replacer fed and the starter. So don't use that to figure out that, well, we should have a 25% uh, starter protein if we're trying to get 2.2 pounds a gain. That's that's not the way it, it really is comprised of. So um, then there will be uh, conversions of protein and energy. And with the, uh, the old NRC model and the, and the new NASEM model, it after you put in the data about the intake and the like, uh, the composition of what they eat, their, their age and weight and, and environmental temperature, then you will get predictions of their protein available for daily gain and separately their energy available for daily gain. And that leads to the, this next figure. It was a figure that originally put together the, the red and yellow uh, columns. Those are for protein available daily gain and energy daily gain from the 2001 NRC. Now notice that the amount of protein doesn't change much as the body weight increases from 95 to 145 pounds. It's the amount of energy that's needed to grow more that increases. But you see that if you're feeding a 20% protein, 20% fat milk replacer, while you still do a decent job of meeting the protein, the amount of energy available for gain really drops off. So that at 145 pounds, it's almost down to zero energy available for daily gain because the calf is bigger and it takes more energy for maintenance before they can grow. So that was the example from the 2001 Dairy NRC. Now, if you look at the NE, NASEM 2021, you see that there's quite a bit of difference in the prediction of daily gain because it has a more accurate base of body composition data for heifer calves rather than veal calves. And the amount of the difference can be anywhere from two tenths of a pound are three tenths of a pound daily gain. And you see at the very uh, end, uh, 135 and 145 pound body weights, that the amount of energy available for daily gain is negative. So it means that the calves really wouldn't have enough energy to, to even gain weight, even though they have enough protein for about two tenths of a pound gain. So that's a key difference between the previous 2001 model and the 2021 model. Now, Jim has told me at one point that there were some bugs in the model, which you can download, um, but I don't know if they've been corrected, but if they have, I don't anticipate they would change this picture that much. So that's the extent then of the calf uh, section. 
Um, now we'll look at the heifer section. There's no figure or graph, so you can, I guess you end up looking at me. <laughs> but uh, uh, there was quite a bit of difference because I didn't find that the old uh, 2001 heifer requirements was, was very useful or very accurate. And Mike Vanderhart, Michigan State, did quite a job in pulling together uh, various sources of information. So the maintenance requirement is very similar now on a metabolic body weight basis to cows, to dairy cows, and uh, of course to the, the beef cattle requirement, which came out in 2016. Um, and then, of course, if you have heifers on pasture, that's going to be a higher requirement because you have more activity. Whereas if you have heifers in confinement, it may not be quite as, as high because you don't have as much physical activity. But the metabolic, metabolic protein uh, for maintenance is also the same for cows as for growth. Now, a couple of key parts about this. They took into account the frame or structural growth. That's means not only the amount of body weight increased, but also the increase in skeletal muscle, adipose tissue, bone, organs, intestinal tract, and gut contents as, as heifers grow. And they assumed a moderate body condition. So the, these would not be fat heifers. They wouldn't be thin or skinny. And for heifers, uh, no allowance was made for change in body reserves. So you could have some of that happen, but this wouldn't take that account. And for heifers with 2.2 pounds of growth, that's a kilogram, they uh, calculated 1.87 pounds of empty body weight, and then the 3.36 pounds would be gut contents. And so that doesn't change either, that assumption. So if you had a high forage diet, which created more gut fill and heifers, you would have more apparent body weight gain, but that wouldn't be structural gain. That would be gut fill. So it doesn't take that into account. And then the net energy requirement for growth is defined as the energy retained in the body tissues during growth and as a function of the proportion of retained fat and protein. And net protein, of course, is retained protein. Now, uh, as I said, uh, the older growth equations were based on beef data from far back as 1980. And I can relate to it even further back because my PhD thesis at Cornell Project was part of a, a large scale one in which we'd had Angus and Holsteins and we have heifers, steers and bulls. And so they all differed. And that was published in, some of it was in 1980 and 1981. So the equation in the past had very limited heifer, uh, Holstein heifer growth in body condition. But uh, Matt Meyer did his PhD at Cornell with Mike Van Anberg. They had purchased heifers and they grew them and they did complete body condition, uh, body uh, composition data. So that was a key source of information for this new uh, book and, and new requirements. Now, we should talk a minute about optimal heifer growing programs because we should assume and monitor it so that we don't have fattening of heifers. And what's fattening heifers? Anytime you get over about a kilo of gill gain, 1.2 pounds, that's going to be fattening. So if you do two and a half to three pounds daily gain, anything above 2.2 pounds is fattening because that's 2.2 pounds is about the maximum rate of uh, protein deposition. And yet I see times uh, dairy farmers or heifer growers or consultants saying, well, my heifer calves at four to six months of age are averaging two and a half or three or even three and a half pounds a gain. That is possible, but it's fattening. And that's not desirable because when you have fattening in young heifers, you're more likely to continue it for the rest of their growth period because initially fattening is an increase in the number of fat cells 
And then when they're more fat cells, they increase in size and you have more ready, ready uh, fattening. And also the, those excess body weight gains can reduce milk production in the first and subsequent lactation, in addition to um, creating more calving difficulties because when a dairy animal fattens externally, you know it's fat internally. And a lot of that fat can be in the uh, upper body area around the kidneys and in the pelvic canal area. So that restricts the, the area where the calf can be born through. And that's why you would have more calving difficulties with fatter heifers. So that's why we want to be careful and not have uh, fatter heifers, especially at a young age. So let's kind of review of that area uh, of the 2021 edition. Uh, we know it takes a while for that to permeate the, mm -hmm. the field situation and for everybody to become familiar with it. So that's why I waited a year before uh, we're going to, before I reviewed it, because you should have the, uh, the book now. And it is a book. It's a hard copy. So it's easier to handle than soft copy. And it's over 200 pages. So it's, it's a very good uh, reference uh, and should become widely used as the previous edition has been. Lots of great information, Al. So as a, uh, a dairy consultant, a dairy producer, what should I really pay attention to? Can you kind of put it in a bumper sticker for us? I mean, is there something that we should at least initially really have high on our radar screens? Well, I think it comes back to a couple of simple uh, reference points. One is you should know approximately what the birth weight of your calves are. And then when they're weaned at about two months of age, that should have been doubled. That makes sure that you got a good growth rate, but you're not fattening them. Because if, if they weigh say 90 pounds at birth and 180 pounds at the end of two months or 60 days, that's a 90 pound gain, divide that by 60 days you have a pound and a half daily gain. That's quite doable. It's doable higher than that, but I have some reservations because you might start fattening. Then after that, we want to avoid fattening. So we should have some periodic uh, measures of growth, like at six months, what's your body weight? At 12 months, and then prior to calving, you can do another one. It doesn't mean you have to weigh all of them. If you have a larger dairy and you've got groups of calves, you might take um, six or eight, just periodically weigh them and see what they look like, how they're doing. And you can always observe for body condition. That's a good index for heifers, growing heifers, just as well as it is for cows. And if you have fat heifers, you're going to have a problem. So as you, as you mentioned, these came out about, about a year ago now. Um, what's, what's been your, you've been in this industry for a while. What's kind of the time frame when, when folks really start adopting new, I'm still going to call them NRC, but new, yeah. new, day, new recommendations when it comes to, you know, feeding our, our dairy cattle. Is there a huge, is it a big time frame, or do they pretty much jump in and, and, and adopt that? Well, I think they'll jump in and adopt it, but when you have a 200-page book, it takes a while to, to assimilate all that. And of course, there's calf, there's there's a dairy cow model and requirements too. I won't get into any any changes there. But in the calf and heifer area, I think it should be simpler and easier to use the young calf model or to make some periodic measures of heifers to see how you're doing. So I don't think it should take very long to implement that. It's just that uh, with the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic and not being in as many meetings and programs, uh, some of that stuff has been slower to, to occur. And of course, I, during the pandemic, a lot of consultants couldn't get on the dairy farm to mm -hmm. review and see what was going on there. So I think, uh, We've completed a year. That's a good initial period, but it may take another year or two for it to become more widely used. 
Plus, you've given us a great summary here today. And and your column on this topic is actually on feedstuffs.com, and it will appear in our December monthly digital issue. So, Al, thank you so much for for joining us here today and for giving us this insight. Thank you all for joining us as well. Great to have you with us as always. Until next time, for Feedstuffs 365, I'm Sarah Muirhead. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.